Hey there, art nerds. Today we're taking a look at the Rembrandt Basic Watercolor Set. A while back, we did the unbox and swatch review of these 12 basic watercolors from Royal Talons. Today, we're putting them to the patented Natto Studio field test where we're going to paint an actual illustration. And the illustration we're painting today is from my 2019 Lilliputian Living. That was the botanical series. So we've got a Lilliputian kiddo hiding out beneath some giant chanterelle mushrooms. So the materials I'm using today are Stonehenge watercolor paper, a cup of clean water, a couple of ceramic palettes, the Rembrandt basic watercolor set, several brushes, most of which are silver black velvet watercolor brushes, a cup of clean water with a paint puck in the bottom, and some stretcher board, in this case some gator board. Now, a while back, I unboxed and swatched these watercolors that I purchased from Amazon. And the colors in this box are 207, 248, 305, 336, 506, 534, 616, 662, 227, 411, 416, and 708. Or a cool yellow and orange a scarlet red, an alizarin crimson, an ultramarine blue, a cerulean blue, a sap green, a viridian green, a yellow ochre, a burnt sienna, a burnt umber, and a Payne's gray. And all of these colors swatched fairly opaque, which seems to be pretty common for many European watercolor brands with the exception of Sennelier. Mainly, I'm thinking of Schmincke and Lucas 1862. I'd love to do a three-way head-to-head -head comparison against those other brands. Now, for me, that doesn't necessarily pan out to be the best watercolor experience. Those of you who've watched my channel know I really prize color mixing and translucency, which is something that more opaque watercolors are not always the best for. But I am just one artist and I'm not a fine artist. I'm a watercolor comic artist and illustrator. It would really mean a lot to me if you guys checked out my work on Instagram at instagram.com slash soup or if you read my watercolor webcomic, Seven Inch Kara. You can read the first seven chapters for free at seveninchkara.com, or you can help support the work I'm creating by buying it in the Natto shop. I'll put a link as well as a full transcript of this video down in the description below. Now, I've also added something else new to this review, and that's a timer. One of the things that I've really taken to heart is that people agree with me that time lapses can be deceptive. It's difficult to know how long it actually takes to make a piece. So I've included a very cheap kitchen timer from Amazon in this shot. I'll try to keep it within camera frame for the most part. And it doesn't turn over at 60 minutes, it turns over at 100 minutes. So every time you guys see it lap yourself, or lap itself, that's another 100 minutes that I've spent on this project. And I also want to point out that I am stopping that timer every time I'm allowing the paint to just dry and I'm not actually doing anything. So if I'm stopping the video, I've already stopped the timer. So that'll help give you guys an idea of how long it takes to create watercolor paintings. And I'm definitely going to try to include the timer for most of my time lapse pieces. I can't promise every single one, it does take up space but I'll try to include it for most of them. So to begin this piece, I'm using the ultramarine blue in the set to kind of attach the illustration, attach the drawing to the paper, if that makes sense. So I'm doing a gradiated wash at the top of the page just to kind of help create a little bit of cheap background. And then I applied a little bit of atmospheric blue around the illustration. And this kind of just helps the illustration look like it's actually sitting on the page. So when I was unboxing and swatching the Rembrandt watercolors, and these are made in Holland by Royal Talons, and we've talked about Royal Talons in the past. I've reviewed their Angora watercolors, and I've also reviewed their Echo Line liquid watercolors and watercolor markers. So I have a little bit of experience with Royal Talons, but 
These are more opaque than many watercolors I've tested here on the channel, but that seems to be pretty common with many professional watercolor brands from Europe like Lucas and Schmincke. So it really boils down to what you like with watercolors. Like I mentioned before, I'm a watercolor illustrator and comic artist, so translucency and the ability to mix colors without them going muddy on me are really important to me. So right now I'm trying to play to the best uh, affects the best traits of these watercolors and I know that with semi-opaque and opaque watercolors using a grise effect painting your shadows painting your grays in first to kind of establish where all the shadows are going to be that's a technique that works really well with more opaque watercolors because that way you're not painting these really thin glazes on top of your opaque colors and possibly turning them to mud you're applying glazes of your semi-opaque and opaque watercolors on top of the gray and letting the gray kind of influence the colors on top of them. And quite a few of the colors in this palette are very opaque for watercolor. The yellow, the orange, the red are particularly opaque. The cerulean blue is also fairly opaque. So in general, I'm going to adjust how I handle the color a bit because I really do want to showcase what works with these watercolors during the field test portion. Of course, since I'm painting a full illustration, if problems arise, I'm gonna talk about them. You guys are gonna see that. But since I've already unboxed and swatched them and I've gotten an idea for how they're gonna handle, I want to use what I've learned to showcase the paints. That doesn't make it an endorsement. I've said before in some of my other videos that a piece that turns out well is neither an indictment nor an endorsement of the watercolors. It's simply a piece that turned out well because I have enough experience to know how to utilize the paints in that instance. And these paints were purchased off of Amazon using a deal. I think I paid around $56 for them. And that was pretty much only for the 12 piece basic set that you guys see me reviewing here. Not only will I put links to where you can buy them in the description and disclaimer, Amazon links are generally affiliate links and that money goes to help support this channel. But any other links to any other sites, whether it's Jerry's or Blick, those are not affiliate links. I don't see anything from that. And I do try to disclose when I think a certain place has the best price just to help you guys shop a little more savvy. Not only am I going to put the prices in the description below, but I'm going to put a transcript of this video in case you like to read while you listen or you want to go back and check for certain points. There will be links as well as a link to the original unboxing swatch. So check the description and the cards as well. And if you guys would like to get a feel for the kind of art I make, if you're curious about what I do, I highly encourage you to check it out. I am not and do not consider myself to be a fine artist. I'm a comic artist and I'm an illustrator and that's the kind of work I love to make. You guys can check out my illustration at instagram.com slash netosoup or you can read my webcomic at 7inchcara.com. If you'd like to support the comics that I make and you'd like a copy for yourself, you can order copies of Volume 1, Volume 2, and Lilliputian Living, which this illustration comes from, in my Natto shop, and I'll link those as well. So now that I've finished with the grise effect, I've mixed some of the sap green with a little bit of ultramarine blue to kind of create a bluish green. And I also have some yellow and I'm using that to paint the moss. And I am working from reference for this piece. So we're referencing the chanterelles, we're referencing the moss. I wanna paint what things actually look like to the best of my ability while still keeping an illustration-y style. While this was still wet, I dabbed in some yellow and I also dabbed in some ultramarine blue. This is gonna help give us that kind of mossy technique. And something I've learned with more opaque watercolors is you wanna do a lot of your color mixing wet into wet and let those pigments mingle, let there be optical uh, mixing on the paper. Let the paper and the wet paint do a lot of the work for you if possible. So to mix up the skin tone that I'm using for the little kiddo here, I'm using a little bit of yellow ochre with a little bit of our uh, warmer red color. I, it could be a scarlet lake, it could be a vermilion, to mix up kind of a basic light skin color. And then as our first layer of moss has dried, I'm just going in and applying more of the green. So I wanna point out that it would have been really nice to have used that Viridian green at some point in this, but it's basically so weak, 
so unwilling to activate that it's basically unusable. And that brings up another point. I feel like some of the color choices in this set are a little bit weird compared to what other brands think of as like basic colors. Like they include an orange, which you can very easily mix an orange. It, they included um, a bright green. So it's not necessarily what I would call a sap green. It's a brighter green than that. Um, which you could easily mix with a yellow and a phthalo blue. They included cerulean rather than say a phthalo blue. And they included that viridian that's just basically useless. They also included a Payne's gray rather than a black, but I actually like when palettes do that. I find that way more usable and it's very easy to mix a good black if you've got a Payne's gray. Now I am aware that a Payne's gray is just a convenience color. It's burnt umber mixed with ultramarine blue, but I use uh, Payne's gray so much that it is beneficial for me for it to be in a palette. I also find that black, unless it's like a warm black or a granulating black, tends to be too strong for what I mix. So black and white are the two watercolors that are often included in palettes that I basically just never use. So for these chanterelle mushrooms, the reference shows them to be these really vibrant yellow and orange mushrooms. Now I've had chanterelles in the past, but I've never gone out picking them. I've never got to experience them in their native habitat, glowing like little jewels in the forest. So I'm gonna have to trust my reference for this one. I found that colors layer surprisingly well and some colors have really lovely granulation on this Stonehenge aqua paper. And I don't know if I've mentioned this because I'm actually re-recording the narration on this. It's the second time I deleted it by accident. Whoops! Um, but Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press, which is what I'm using here, is a really great all-rounder, inexpensive cotton rag paper. If you're newer to watercolor, if you want to play around on cotton rag paper, but you don't want the expensive cotton rag paper, this could be a really good place to start. My only complaint about Stonehenge Aqua is I don't think it has as much sizing internal or external as some other brands do, so it can get pulpy if you add too much paper water but if you allow it to dry completely that's not really an issue so it's a good paper it's an inexpensive paper you can find it a lot of places and it's got a nice pronounced cold press texture so if you're painting with granulating paints you're going to get some really nice effects with it it also comes in hot press and their hot press is one of my favorite hot press papers i did not like hot press paper until i tried stonehenge hot press paper and I actually have a video where I compare the two just to kind of give you guys a heads up of what the different working properties are so if you're interested in this paper that's something you should definitely check out and I think I also have standalone videos where I talk about each one respectively basically if you're on the market for paints or papers I've got reviews here on the channel that have got you covered so I hope you guys will check those out now I do find that the opacity is useful. Uh, you can build up layers of color and build up glazes that have actual impact. They don't just get lost on the illustration. This is particularly true with these yellows and oranges. So originally these chanterelles were very gray, right? Because I'd applied a grise. And now we're applying a yellow and an orange and it's not even full saturation. It's not even full tint. And we're able to get some really nice coverage and we're able to really develop those shadows. And that is something that opaque and semi-opaque watercolors, when they're well-made watercolors, when they're not student grade watercolors, when they are just a lot of pigment rather than a lot of optical brighteners or a lot of filler, that's something that higher quality professional semi-opaque and opaque watercolors can bring to the table. They do sometimes behave quite a bit like gouache and if you're like me and you find gouache itself to be frustrating and challenging, I don't like acrylics either, uh, then semi-opaque watercolors like these might be a good middle ground for you that's a little bit easier to use. Now I did notice that these pen paints tend to glop up on the brush. You tend to pick up a lot of paint when you're trying to just grab a little bit of color. Um, that's something you definitely want to be aware of. You probably can't go straight from the palette to your paper. So you may find yourself going through these paints quicker than you might with other brands that don't 
glop up on the brush as much. So they may not be as economical as some of the other brands we've talked about here on the channel. But again, it really boils down to how you like to paint and what you like to do with your watercolors. If you're looking for opacity, if you're looking for granulation, if you don't wanna apply a million super thin layers because you're having trouble building up the color's intensity, these could be a great fit for you. So you guys can see I'm going into the moss and adding little highlights of yellow. With a less opaque brand, with a less opaque yellow, that would basically be impossible. They'd be lost on the green, you wouldn't see it. Whereas with these, it's a bit like wash. You definitely can see it. So you can actually go back in and add colored highlights, which is really nice. That's usually something I have to do with watercolor pencil later on. I'm also able to add a lot of layers, especially on the mushrooms. I'm able to build up a lot of layers. And that's something I thought I wouldn't be able to do given how opaque these are. That's something that um, I find I am not as able to do with the Lucas watercolors, for example. I also want to admit that going into this field test, I felt like I wasn't going to like these paints. I wasn't particularly impressed with them when I was doing the unboxing swatch. They just really didn't speak to me. I know that sounds kind of goofy, but sometimes there's just some paints like the Paul Rubens tube paints that you just really, really like handling and you know you're going to like them. And these didn't speak to me during the unboxing swatch. It wasn't until the field test where I'm actually painting an illustration, where I'm figuring out how to use the paints, when I'm trying to recreate something, that I realized I do like these paints. I am enjoying them and I would be interested in trying, if Rembrandt has tube watercolors, and I think they do, um, I would be interesting, interested in trying some of their tube watercolors because sometimes with brands, the half pants handle very differently from the tubes. And sometimes I really love the tubes and I don't like the half pants. And I just talked about Paul Rubens. That is a primo example. I got the Paul Rubens half pans on AliExpress years ago. Did not like them. I received the Paul Rubens tubes as a Christmas gift and I love them. And it's not just that they were a gift. They handle like night and day way better than the half pants. So I mentioned earlier that there's some colors in the set that are just kind of weird considering we only have 12 colors in a set. Like another example would be we get a yellow ochre, we get a burnt sienna, and we get a burnt umber. That's three neutral colors in a 12 color set. That's one fourth of the set. Um, we only get one yellow and it's kind of a middle of the road yellow, which is useful. I think if you're going to skimp, having just a middle, not a cool yellow, not a warm yellow, just a yellow is useful. But the orange, again, you can mix an orange super simply. And even though I am using the orange, it's mostly because I'm trying to use every color in the palette. It's not because I can't mix my own orange. In fact, with watercolor, I'm actually very used to mixing my own oranges. And I only have oranges in my set if it's like, like Chinese orange. If it's a color that would take a little bit of finagling for me to confidently mix it up or like the cerulean blue. It's not, it's a warm cerulean blue. It's not that different from the ultramarine that they've included in the set. And I'm using the cerulean blue to paint the stripes on her dress. And it's just kind of a challenging color to use when you're using something that's so small. I'm also using the cooler red. I think it's an alizarin crimson on her jacket. Like I said, with these field tests, sometimes I'm not trying to paint the most aesthetic illustration. I'm trying to use all the colors at least a little bit to see how they handle because like with that Viridian Green, sometimes you get just a real fail boat of a color, a color that just doesn't want to work. It just doesn't want to paint. And on that note, the burnt sienna, because I'm using burnt sienna mixed with yellow ochre, I wanted her to have like honey blonde hair. And I really kind of struggled with it because that burnt sienna just does, it's a very weak burnt sienna. It really doesn't want to activate. Um, a regular umber would be more useful in this instance. But I mean, then you also have the burnt umber. I don't know. I really don't think you need both burnt sienna and burnt umber in it in a set this small. I think you can have just like a regular umber and if you want it to be a little bit lighter, you can add more water or you can add yellow ochre or you can add a tinge of red. Or if you want it to be darker, you can add in the Payne's gray and start getting into burnt umber territory. There's just no reason for a set this small to have 
such weird color choices, frankly. So I apologize, my camera is freaking out on me. It's freaky outying and I'm not super sure why, but at this point, I'm just kind of finagling and finessing things, trying to add in more shadow, trying to add in more depth, trying to add in more details. I'm trying to illustrate the gills of the mushroom using the Payne's gray. Um, I'm adding in some more red because I really want to capture that like super saturated dark orange that you get in the sort of in the low point of a chanterelle. Now I did find that these watercolors do reactivate even if they've been allowed to dry on your palette. As I mentioned earlier, I'm working with ceramic palettes for this piece. I do find that watercolors tend to reactivate a little bit more cleanly when I'm working on ceramic. Um, for years, I mostly used plastic palettes because I traveled a lot and ceramic palettes are heavy and don't travel well. But now that I think we're pretty stationary in one place, I'm definitely going to be painting with ceramic palettes a bit more. And one of them is an actual watercolor palette and one of them is just a plate from Dollar Tree. And I happen to really love my Dollar Tree plate palette. It works quite well. So all in all, I really enjoyed using these paints for this illustration, but I don't think I am going to turn to Paul Rubens, uh, not Paul Rubens, I'm so sorry, Paul Rubens, Rembrandt watercolors time and again for my illustration needs. I don't think it's because they're not high quality watercolors. I think it's because for how I paint and the kind of illustrations I create, they're just a little bit opaque. And this particular set is a little bit of a head scratcher for me in terms of the, the colors they chose to include. So it's not a set that I just immediately, if I'm going out to go paint flowers or if I am traveling and I wanna do some illustration, I'm not gonna grab this set. The colors are a little bit weird for me. Some of them don't work or have really weak activation and they're just a little bit too opaque considering how small I paint and how many layers I tend to paint. I tend to do a lot of layers and a lot of glazes. Speaking of layers and glazes, I mixed up a shadow color for her skin tone, um, a little bit of alizarin crimson with a little bit of ultramarine blue, just to add in some shadows. That's a pretty common technique for me and I really didn't have any issues. So it ended up being, I wanna say 122 minutes paint time and that's not including the dry time. So now I'm gonna go in and add some white highlights here and there using just some plain white gouache. It's Utrecht gouache, but I will use almost any professional grade white gouache to add highlights. I'm not really particular. It's a lot of Utrecht, a lot of Blick, and a lot of Windsor and Newton, basically whoever I can get my hands on. And this piece was allowed to dry overnight before I'm adding in these details. Um, it took about a, a couple, two days, like an evening, and then, you know, adding details in the next morning. So it's not a particularly complicated piece, but I did enjoy painting it. Don't, don't let me get you wrong. Now, I do think this palette might be a good one for people who like to do landscapes. Not because of that Viridian Green, replace that Viridian Green. But I have noticed that my friends who do landscape studies, they tend to paint fewer layers than I do and they may use the opacity to create a misty effect. So this might be a better fit for you. Um, and maybe if you do a different kind of portrait art, if you're more fine art and you mix your purples in with your skin tones and no shame in that, I just don't this might be a better set for you. But for me, a watercolor comic artist who does illustration, not the greatest fit, not not the best fit for me. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't find myself recommending this to a friend who made art similar to the art I make because it just doesn't really mesh well. It's not a bad set. They're not poor quality watercolors. It's nothing like that. It's just not a good fit in this instance. And this is why I think it's amazing that there are so many different types of watercolor artists here on YouTube who do reviews. You know, people want to compare me to, um, oh, gee whiz, give me a sec. People will compare what I do to, say, Parka Blogs or to the Frugal Crafter or the Mind of Watercolor. Um, and the, the, the flat out truth of the matter is all three of us do very different types of watercolor. It's not really an apt comparison. I think all three of us are reviewing 
products based on our experiences and what we like from those products. And those are very different categories. I don't do urban painting. I don't do fine art watercolor. I don't necessarily paint a lot of objects or a lot of realistic portraits. I paint watercolor comics. I review watercolors based on that specific thing. And I don't think there are a lot of artists here on YouTube who necessarily paint watercolor comics or have painted as many pages as I have. I mean, I'm on the second volume of a long-standing watercolor comic. And that doesn't de degrade what they're bringing to the table. I think it elevates what they're bringing to the table because we're all bringing something that's very, very different. And that's why I rely on you guys to recommend my content if you enjoy the tutorials I make, if you enjoy the videos I make, to recommend them to friends who are going to also enjoy them. People who are interested in picking up watercolor for illustration, people who are interested in picking up watercolor for comics, this channel could be a wonderful resource for them. So just because Lindsay got to it before I did, doesn't mean what I have to say isn't still valid because we're coming at it from very, very different viewpoints. We're coming from coming at it from very different backgrounds. So her opinions are super valid and what I have to say about them is also super valid. And um, I'm just bringing that up because I know I am never first to anything. And um, sometimes that bums me out just because it'd be nice to, to be there early. But, uh, and I feel like I'm always the last one but I am buying these things out of pocket. I do have a limited budget to purchase these things with. And when I'm reviewing these things, I have to kind of slot them in with all the other paying work that I'm doing. So it's a juggling act. And um, I think there's still some validity in hearing what a watercolor comic artist has to say about these watercolors. Because if you're a watercolor comic artist, these are probably not gonna be the best fit for you. Now, if you just do one or two layers, I can see that. They're opaque. They're going to give you a lot of color. Many of these colors, but not all, are fairly saturated. But there's a couple of snoozer colors in here. <clears throat> Viridian and Burnt Sienna. And in a 12-piece palette, that takes out, that's one-sixth of your paints that don't really work well at all. So that's definitely, I know I keep harping on it, but it kind of blows my mind. Like, Rembrandt, you're a well-esteemed company. What is up with that Viridian? Why is it so awful? So the total time for this piece ended up being 153 minutes and 58 seconds. Clock looped around once. Um, I had a good time painting this piece, but these are not the best watercolors in the world and I would not necessarily recommend them to other watercolor comic artists. So my verdict, if you enjoy watercolors that often, but not always deliver a bold pop of color, Rembrandt might be the brand for you. Colors are generally more opaque, so this, uh, may mean less layering. The color selection in this particular palette is a bit odd to me, especially compared to other 12 color palettes I reviewed, but it seems like it might work well for landscape painters. The Viridian Green is weak and in my opinion, unusable in the palette I purchased. If you've had a different experience with Rembrandt's Viridian, please let me know in the comments below. Really though, these are probably not for me. I prefer translucent color and quick activation. While I love granulation, I like a variety. Some colors more finely milled and not every color opaque. So the pros and cons. Well, for me, this set has more cons than pros. So we're gonna start with the cons. Weird color selection, considering there's only 12 colors. Some colors just flat out don't work, which is not a good thing. A little bit too opaque, considering I like to paint watercolor comics. I've only mentioned that like 30 times in this video. Um, a little bit difficult to find. Don't always see the, I didn't see these at Jerry's, didn't see these at Plaza. David's might have them, Blick probably has them, Amazon does have them. So if you're a brick and mortar, you like to buy in person kind of person, you're not gonna find these at your average big box art supply store. Like, you know, Michael's doesn't carry these. Royal Talons has a fairly extensive line. They carry a lot of different things. Sometimes I love their stuff, sometimes I don't. This one was not a hit for me. So the pros is these are actually very easy to layer. They're easy to reactivate on a ceramic palette like these if they've dried out overnight. They don't turn to mud, which kind of surprised me considering how opaque they are. So I can see these being a good fit for some artists. They're just not a good fit for me. 
So I hope you guys found this field test to be helpful, useful, and informative, maybe even a little bit entertaining. If you're looking for watercolor tutorials, I have a few playlists to help you guys out. I'll link those down in the description below. If you're looking for the right professional grade watercolor for you, I've got a playlist for that. I'll link that as well. And if you're on the market for a decent watercolor paper, hey y'all, I review those as well. So I'll link that in the description as well. If you like what I do and you want to help me continue to do it, please consider supporting my work over on Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com slash soup. And if you think my art is cute and you'd like to see more of it, please join me on Instagram.